So yeah, so thanks so much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, and I want to talk to you about something very, very important. Um, and I want to start by saying that at first, you wouldn't notice anything. And then, suddenly, everything would change, radically and violently. Imagine yourself 500 years in the future. You're sitting in a ship, zipping through the silent, empty void of outer space. You're traveling to explore a black hole up close for the first time in human history. You're very lucky to be able to do this. For centuries, the prospect of traveling to a black hole was absurd. The closest one is nearly 60 million billion kilometers away, but great advancements were made in space travel and cryogenics, and here you are. You're traveling to explore a black hole, and you're about to make a very big mistake. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. What is a black hole? <clears throat> Everyone here is either sitting down or standing. That might not sound like a profound statement, but cosmically, it kind of is. And I like to remind myself that in times of hardship like this, around the world right now, with terrible things happening all the time, and things trying to pull us apart as people, no matter who you are, I like to remind myself that no matter who you are, no matter your gender or skin color, you all have one very important thing in common. You're not currently floating around the room. Why are you not floating? Because of gravity, of course. Gravity is the force of attraction between any two large objects, like between the moon and the earth, or between the earth and you. But behind that very, very important, uh, but that, behind that very, very simple statement, which I'm sure you've heard a zillion times before, lies a series of very deeply profound insights that require us to completely change our understanding of the fabric of reality. The underlying question is as follows. We all know what gravity as a word is, but what causes gravity? This is the type of question that keeps us physicists up at night. Because if a physicist comes to you and asks, what causes X phenomena? Perhaps you've heard this from a teacher sometime. What causes X phenomenon? And you tell her, that's just the way it is, she will be deeply dissatisfied with your answer. Because physics, among other things, is the search for mechanisms, reasons and explanations for how and why certain things happen. And in fact, we can go a little further even to ask an even bigger, broader question. Here we are at something called Science City, this beautiful facility that I'm visiting for the first time. So we should ask ourselves the question, what is science itself? <clears throat> Science in general is a method of asking and answering questions about the world that allows us to make conclusions about the way the world works. Science is a process, it's, but also a mindset or a particular kind of attitude toward the unknown. Scientists are the ones who look for causes and mechanisms. Examples, the germ theory of disease, the way genetics and heredity work, archaeology, geology, the climate crisis, etc. All of the things we typically think about when we talk about science. But a scientist or a science-minded person can also use this attitude toward other things, like, for example, social issues around us. So arguably, the two most pressing emergencies of our current age are the climate crisis and extreme wealth inequality, or the problem of poverty. Some people might look at the problem of poverty and say, well, that's just the way it is. But a scientist would look at this and say, hmm, no, poverty has causes, and causes that are, for example, specific policies and choices. Is this something that can be changed? Yes, policies can be changed. Policies that would solve property. Poverty. This is the scientist's task. And I use this rather arcane example just to remind you that to approach the unknown, that's what a scientist does. A scientist goes to the very edge of our human knowledge and asks, 
What's beyond that? And, you can, you, and so the, the whole point, though, is that we want to investigate the limits of knowledge and to determine whether this unknown we've run into, this unknown, is one of two things. Is it an intrinsic limitation of our knowledge, or is it an artificial one? Is this an in-principle solvable problem, or is there something built into the universe that makes this impossible to know? Is that me, or is that something else? That's distracting. Is it in indeed, or is it impossible to know? I would dare say that the vast majority of problems in the universe are indeed solvable. And if you hear someone say, that's just the way it is, or I guess we'll never know, or such a thing is beyond human understanding, you know that you're talking to someone who does not understand or pretends not to understand how science works. And so back to our story, the question, what causes gravity, was for a long time unanswered. Even Isaac Newton, a very clever guy who in the, in the 1600s described how gravity works with unprecedented accuracy, even Newton himself famously admitted that although his equations were very successfully descriptive, he didn't know what caused gravity. So, what, and so for example, he said this in his, uh, in his famous uh, uh, Philosophia Naturalis, I have not as yet been able to discover the reason for these properties of gravity from phenomena, and I do not feign hypotheses. A scientist always admits when they don't understand something. So what is it? What is the mechanism that keeps you stuck in your chair and that keeps the moon in orbit around the Earth? For a long time, no one could say. People would, some people would claim, well, gravity is a universal force, and it's always been that way. But for everyone else, this sounded far too close to, that's just the way it is. This finally changed in the early 20th century. In 1915, Albert Einstein produced his general theory of relativity, which finally provided an excellent mechanism to explain how gravity arises and required us to completely change our perspective on nature in the process. When an apple falls from a tree, what is it falling through? OK, the atmosphere, for, for sure. But what about the moon? As the moon orbits the Earth, what is the moon moving or falling through? There's no atmosphere, so it's falling through empty space. But what is space? For the longest time, space was, the concept of space was more or less like a metaphorical coordinate system, like the two-dimensional grid on a chalkboard. The lines you draw on the grid to make shapes to the real physical objects you're studying, for example, if I want to draw a circle to, to, uh, to, to indicate like a planet or a star or something like that. But the lines on the blackboard, just the coordinate system, they're just a coordinate system, a figurative structure you posit in the background to help with your calculations or your geometry. In fact, it's so metaphorical or abstract that as you with the person with the chalk, you can choose a different coordinate system if you wanted to. The background is just a shortcut, right? A helpful organizing principle. But it's certainly not real in the sense of it being a physical object that can move or flow or be subject to anything physical. I mean, if I draw a big, thick circle on my chalkboard, it doesn't affect the chalkboard itself. The chalkboard just sits there in the background. Surely, the thing that we refer to as empty space is like that, right? Wrong. It turns out that space is a malleable, bendable, and fluid thing. And as Einstein pointed out, the force of gravity arises because the presence of a large amount of stuff within a certain volume of space creates a kind of sinkhole in space itself. The denser the object, the deeper the sinkhole. This was a wildly different way of thinking about the universe. It would mean that as I start to draw a thicker and thicker circle on my chalkboard, the board would start to bend and my grid would become deformed. In this sense, space is not fixed like this chalkboard, but is more like a rubber sheet stretched tight in all directions. With a completely flat sheet, if I send a small marble rolling along with some momentum, it will go in a straight line. But if I put a dense bowling ball on the sheet, the sheet will be deformed. And now when I send the marble along, 
the marble still thinks it's traveling in a straight line, but from its perspective, from its perspective, it thinks it's traveling in a straight line. But from a distant perspective, the marble is falling into the curved space of the bowling ball. This is what the presence of stuff does to the fabric of space. And thus, we have our mechanism. The moon and the earth are attracted to one another because each is falling into the gravitational sinkhole of the other. But they don't collide because they have just enough momentum in their own straight line direction to balance this out. This is a radically new way of thinking about the universe and of thinking about the fabric of space. But it gets worse. Because according to general relativity, space not only bends, but flows. Yes, space can move relative to some other set of points in space. This was a phenomenally weird postulate, and it had some remarkable consequences. The extent to which space bends and flows depends upon how much stuff, matter, and energy density you pack into a given volume. <clears throat> Excuse me. The more stuff you pack into a given volume, the more, space severe, the more severely space bends and flows toward the center of that volume. So the sun has a certain density, and it bends space a certain amount. A neutron star has a much higher density and bends space even more severely. You can think about this bending and flowing of space due to the presence of some amount of dense stuff by thinking about how fast you'd need to travel to get away from these objects. So sitting here on Earth, you'd need to travel pretty quickly to escape Earth's gravity. But of course, we know that it can be done. If you wanted to travel away from the sun, I don't know why you're on the surface of the sun to begin with, but if you wanted to travel away from the surface, which you probably would want to do, you'd need to travel about 50 to 60 times faster than that. And to get away from a neutron star, you need to travel at something like 60% of the speed of light. And the remarkable thing about general relativity about this bending and flowing of space due to some dense object is that if you look closely at the math, and as you know, you should always look closely at the math, eventually you can take all of this to its logical conclusion. Eventually, if you pack too much stuff into a fixed volume, space bends and flows so severely and so rapidly that no matter how quickly you travel, you'd never be able to escape this flow. And this is a black hole. You can think of a black hole in space like an extremely strong water drain where the water is the fabric of space itself. Imagine you're a fish in the water. If you get too close to the drain, the water will be flowing inward faster than you can swim. And even if you swim at your fastest possible speed, you'll be sucked into the drain. Likewise, if you stay far enough away from a black hole in space, you're OK. But there's a point of no return called the event horizon, beyond which space is flowing into the middle of the black hole faster than the speed of light. Forget about your spaceship. Not even light can travel away from a black hole. But if that's the case, <laughs> then what's happening inside? What's inside a black hole? This is the zillion dollar question. And it might not even be possible for humans to answer in any traditional sense. Because there are two things that probably jumped out at you. The first is that thing there in the middle, a singularity, a rather scary word. If you take this discussion to its logical conclusion, then at the center of a black hole sits a point that simply doesn't make any sense. Recall that the denser an object is, the more it curves and warps space. This means that mathematically, at the center of a black hole sits a point of infinite density some large amount of stuff in a zero volume point and infinite curvature. I don't know about you, but I simply have no idea what a point of infinite density and infinite curvature means physically, and I'm a physicist. Usually when our mathematics concludes something that makes no logical or physical sense, this is the universe's way of telling us that we're missing something. 
It's likely that our universe doesn't actually use singularities, and that when we better understand what's happening inside of a black hole, some new theories in mathematics will be needed to avoid such nearly physically meaningless conclusions. But this is also related to the second thing you probably noticed. If, past the event horizon, space is flowing into the center of the black hole faster than the speed of light, then if some intrepid physicist wanted to go inside of a black hole to study it, there's no way for her to send what she learned back to the rest of us. Once she passed the event horizon, there is no signal that she could send that could reach the rest of us safely outside the black hole because no information can travel faster than the speed of light. Because of this, if you wanted to travel to a black hole to study it up close, and you should definitely want to do this, because I do, you'd probably want to stay safely away from the event horizon, at least initially. The first reason is, like I mentioned, scientific. If you fell into a black hole, you couldn't send your data back to the rest of the scientific community, which makes you a bad scientist. But the second reason is, shall we say, <clears throat> existential. Depending upon the size and conditions of the black hole, as you pass the event horizon, your physical condition, your bodily condition, could potentially change very quickly. The particularly extreme way space curves and flows could mean that, for example, the gravitational pull on your head would be very different from the pull on your feet. Consider the fish and the water drain. Unlike a fish sucked into a water drain, if a fish fell into a black hole, the extreme gravitational conditions would probably very quickly stretch and bend the fish into something resembling fish spaghetti. <clears throat> For black holes of a certain size, you would probably not live very long once you pass the event horizon, let alone be able to conduct experiments. This, of course, corresponds to what some of us know about black holes from speculative fiction or sci-fi movies or something like that that black holes are these twisted vortices that suck in entire stars and would stretch and crush you if you fell in. But there's a very big caveat here, which we'll get to a bit later. Because the other thing you're probably asking is, how do we know black holes exist? I mean, maybe, like I mentioned, they're just some kind of mathematical oddity that our universe wisely avoids. Black holes were indeed a strange prediction of general relativity, and for many decades they remained this sort of science fiction sounding oddball hypothesis that no one necessarily expected to be confirmed, and of which no one really understood the full importance until the 60s and 70s, when astronomers noticed Cygnus X1. So this is in fact, Cygnus, this is, a, this is a, an actual image from, I believe from Hubble or Webb or something like that, probably Hubble. And in this image right here, I defy you to find the black hole. But there is in fact a black hole in this image. It's right there. <laughs> so this in fact is an artist's rendition. This is in fact an artist's rendition of Cygnus X1. But what astronomers saw, observed in 1964, was evidence for something like this. They saw gas being sucked away from a blue supergiant star in a particularly weird way as this gas spiraled towards something that didn't itself radiate like another star would. Imagine, you know, if you had a binary system of two stars, you'd see them both radiating. <clears throat> but as this gas spiraled towards something else, it became so hot that it emitted high energy X-rays and gamma rays that were detectable. And such observations were very much what was expected if a black hole were eating this blue supergiant. And since then, the evidence for black holes has only grown. Because not even light can escape from a black hole, we can't see them directly, but we can see stars orbiting completely empty spots in space. And additionally, a black hole should create a distinct pattern of radio waves emitted from the hot, bent gas swirling around it, which, as you know, was detected by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration in 2019 for a black hole in the galaxy M87, 55 million light years away. Now, despite what you may have read, this is not a photograph of a black hole. 
it's literally impossible to, to photograph a black hole in a conventional sense for the reason we just mentioned. But this is an image of the radiation emitted by gas as it's twisted around a black hole. And this pattern very, very closely matches the pattern we'd expect from the mathematics of a black hole. Black holes are really real indeed. And they're not even that rare. <laughs> For such extreme, mysterious, dark objects, it turns out that black holes are all over the place. The universe loves these twisted vortices, and they come in a surprising variety of sizes. There's a big one at the center of nearly every large galaxy we've observed, including the one at Sagittarius A star in the center of our own Milky Way. But they're floating around our galaxy as well. The closest confirmed black hole is this, <clears throat> the one I mentioned, Cygnus X1, discovered in, the, uh, discovered in the 60s and 70s, which is about six or 7,000 light years away. Given that the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years in diameter, cosmically, Cygnus X1 is not that far away. In fact, there could be, an, there could be a mysterious black hole even shockingly closer to Earth. In the outer edge of our solar system, several big rocks seem to be orbiting in strange ways. Some astronomers think there's a new planet, Planet 9, that could be responsible for these odd, wobbling orbits. But we see no evidence of a visible planet. So perhaps the reason we haven't seen it is that it's not a planet, but in fact is an, a black hole about the size of an apple that was formed not long after the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, and that floated around our universe before eventually getting stuck in our solar system. And in fact, I know the theorists who propose this as an idea, and it's fascinating because in their paper, they actually give, so this is a scientific paper in the supplemental material, they actually give a life-size image of what the black hole would look like which is pretty cool. For most scientific papers can't give you an actual life-size, one-to-one image uh, of, uh, of what a black hole would look like. <laughs> so an apple-sized black hole, could you make a black hole your If you want to know what it takes to make a black hole, simply uh, grab your textbook on gravity. I assume you all have a textbook on gravity on your bedside table and find the black hole equation, like I do. Find the black hole equation. It tells you for some given amount of mass the size of a volume you'd have to pack it in to make a black hole. It's really that straightforward. So for example, if you wanted to make a black hole out of the entire Earth, you'd need to pack the whole thing into a volume about the size of a blueberry. Most black holes we know of, of course, are substantially bigger than apples or blueberries. Sagittarius A star in the center of our Milky Way has a diameter equivalent to about one-third of the distance from the Earth to the Sun, but with a mass four million times that of the Sun. And, but there are black holes much bigger than that in other galaxies, with masses tens of billions of times that of the Sun, packed into volumes much larger than our solar system. But it's really that simple. This equation tells you how to make a black hole. And we can use it for other masses, too. For example, a proton. Imagine a proton just sitting around. This doesn't happen very often, but imagine a proton just sitting around. A proton is already very small, about 10 to the power minus 15 meters in diameter. So to make a black hole out of a proton, you need to pack it into a sphere with a diameter that's 10 billion billion times smaller than something called the Planck length. So given that the Planck length is the smallest physically meaningful length that quantum mechanics allows us to define, a proton is safe. You'll never make a black hole out of a proton just sitting around. What about you? To make a black hole out of you, we need to pack you into a volume about the size uh, uh, of, uh, we need to pack you into volume one ten billionth the size of a proton. Given that this is a thousand times smaller than the smallest distance scales that our species can currently resolve, currently at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, you are safe. We'll never make a black hole out of you. 
What about something bigger, like our sun? To make a black hole out of the sun, you'd need to pack it into a sphere that stretches from about right here at Science City to a little bit beyond the Victoria Memorial. I know that when uh, the traffic gets difficult in Kolkata, sometimes it seems like it's going to be dense enough to create a kind of singularity, but alas, it's a far cry from packing the entire sun into a, uh, around the center of Kolkata. What about something even bigger? What about the observable universe? Recall what we said about the fabric of space is not just some fixed background grid, but is in fact a malleable, bendable, flowing thing. This is true not just near stars and planets, but on large scales as well. You may have heard that the universe is expanding, and it's true. But you might have asked yourself, expanding into what? Is, it, is our universe sort of like a, a balloon being blown up inside of a box, and eventually it's going to hit the walls of the box? No. Spa it's expanding into nothing. Space itself is expanding and has been doing so for billions of years. And because of the particular way that our universe expanded right at its birth, now there are parts of the universe that are so far away that there simply hasn't been enough time for light from those parts to reach us. Thus, there is a difference between the entire universe and the observable universe. The observable universe is a sphere centered on you that contains all the stuff in the universe that's close enough to have sent a light signal that we can detect. But the entire universe is much, much larger than that and possibly infinite in size. So it's impossible, nearly impossible to say how much stuff is in the entire universe, but we can estimate how much stuff is in our observable universe. The observable universe right now is a sphere of about 93 billion light years in diameter. And if we add up all of the regular matter, like the protons, neutrons, and electrons that make up you and me and potatoes, and all of the neutrinos, and all of the dark matter, and all of the photons, and all of the gravitational waves in the observable universe, we get a very large number, approximately 10 to the power 54 kilograms. So if you wanted to make a black hole out of the observable universe, you just put it into the equation. You need to pack the entire observable universe into a volume that's about three times the diameter of the observable universe. Let me double check that. So, OK, well, maybe these estimates are perhaps a bit rough. Of course, maybe the mass estimate is a, is a bit inaccurate. I mean, maybe that mass estimate is, say, twice as high as the real number. That's a big mistake, right? Imagine you're having a party in your back, uh, backyard, and you've invited all of the neighborhood children, and, and your mother says, oh, how many children are coming over? And you don't know if the answer is 100 or 200. That's a big difference. So imagine that we got the, we got the mass of the observable universe wrong by a factor two, something like that. So imagine that the mass estimate that we just give is, say, twice as high as the real number. So if we assume that the mass of the uni observable universe is about half that number, to make a black hole out of the observable universe, you need to pack the thing into an entire thing into a volume that's just a little bit larger than the size of the observable universe. Do we live inside an enormous black hole? When I first came across this calculation, I was dumbfounded. Is it possible that our universe is the interior of an unfathomably large black hole? At first glance, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I thought that black holes were these twisted vortices that suck in entire stars and would stretch and crush you if you fell in, right? It turns out that it depends upon the size of the black hole. You'd have no chance inside of a small enough black hole, like the solar mass black hole around the center of Kolkata. You'd be very quickly cr uh, crushed or stretched into spaghetti. 
But if you pass the event horizon of a large enough black hole, shockingly, you'd be OK for a while at least. But that while can, in principle, be a very long time. It would still be a one-way trip. There's no way to cross back over the event horizon. But if the black hole were big enough, you'd be fine. And yes, it's entirely possible that our entire universe is inside a gargantuan black hole. This is very weird, I admit. But black holes are more than just astrophysical oddities. If you think about it, they're actually quite profound statements about the limitations of knowledge. Recall what we talked about at the beginning, about how physics, about how science, is about going to the edge of our human knowledge, finding a barrier, and then asking, is this an intrinsic barrier, intrinsic to our understanding of the universe, or is this an artificial barrier? For example, I mentioned that if I wanted to make a black hole out of a proton, I need to pack it into a volume that's smaller than something called the Planck length. Well, it turns out that the Planck length, like I said, is the smallest physically meaningful distance scale that quantum mechanics allows us to define. Because of the way that quantum mechanics works, the kind of weirdness of quantum mechanics, there's no way around that limitation. I can write down a number on a piece of paper, of course, that's some number smaller than the Planck length, but there's no way for me, even in principle, to design a measuring device that could measure something smaller than that length. That is an intrinsic limitation to our knowledge. But a black hole also represents another kind of intrinsic limitation. If I were inside of a black hole, Again, I could, not see, I could never be able to get outside of that black hole because of the way that, it's, that, it's, uh, that it behaves. Because think about what a black hole really does. The event horizon, this kind of point of no return that I talked about, separates the physical world into two regions, outside the black hole and inside the black hole. And once you're inside the black hole, the event horizon becomes this barrier, this border, this thing that's always in the distance, but that you can never reach, also known as a horizon. Imagine you're on a boat in the ocean, and you see the horizon in the distance, and you say, I want to go to the horizon. You can go that direction, but because of the nature of it, you'll never reach the horizon. It's always far away from you. It's always something in the distance. We know also that as black holes collect matter or radiation by eating stars, near, nearby stars, for example. Oh, yeah, this is my barrier here, right? So imagine you're inside the black hole. There's this barrier between you. There's an interior and an exterior. We know that as black holes collect matter or radiation by eating nearby stars, for example, they grow. This means that the barrier, the horizon, grows as well. So think about what it would be like inside of a very large black hole. If you're far enough away from the singularity, you'd just be floating in space, and there would be a region of the universe that is always in the distance, always receding from you, always getting larger, but no matter how quickly you traveled, you'd never be able to reach it. So things would be, stuff would be coming inside, and the barrier gets larger, and no matter how quickly you travel, you'd never be able to reach it. Now think about what it's like for you right here, right now on Earth. If you look out into the farthest reaches of space, there's a barrier, a horizon, the limit beyond which we cannot see and cannot reach no matter how quickly we travel, but that's getting larger. So stuff is coming in to our cosmological horizon, the edge of the observable universe, and it's getting slightly larger all the time. Not on the, on the scale of your lifetime, you'll probably not notice anything, but on very large, long, uh, on longer, light, on longer uh, time scales, it's getting larger. These two situations are remarkably similar. And if you look closely at the math, and you should always look closely at the math, you can see that the mathematics of the space inside of a black hole is remarkably similar to the mathematics of space outside of a black hole. So it means that there's some kind of continuity between what we understand about these two kinds of barriers, these two kinds of, uh, the, the two regions of space. So does that mean that, uh, so there's another reason to think that this might not just be crazy talk. 
So recall that we said at the center of a black hole, there should be this point of infinite curvature and infinite density, a singularity. And recall that our universe is expanding. This means that if we simply run the clock backwards, like the YouTube slider of the universe, far back in the, in the past, everything in the universe had to have been packed into a tiny, dense, extremely dense point. So all of our available evidence points toward the notion that our own universe began 13.8 billion years ago at a point of extreme density. Was the Big Bang that birthed our universe a black hole from another universe? And does that mean that black holes in our universe give birth to other universes. Again, this might sound, sound very science fiction -y, and we know that in the last few years, popular culture has really run rampant with this whole idea of the multiverse, usually used to excuse really bad stories. Um, but there are indeed ways to interpret black holes where the center of a black hole is not a singularity, but is in fact a passageway to another part of space and time. These are called Einstein-Rosen bridges, or sometimes wormholes, and they're actually potentially real. The answer to what's inside a black hole could in fact be that, uh, could, could in fact be that a black hole is a portal to another part of our own universe, or perhaps another universe in a multiverse, or that black holes could potentially be the beginning points for new universes. But Despite what you might be thinking not right now, at the end of the day, I'm an experimentalist. And as intriguing and mind-boggling and fascinating as these possibilities are, there is one gigantic problem we can't get away from. We currently have no reasonable idea for testing these hypotheses. First, like we said, if you go into a black hole, there's no way for you to send the information you gained back out to us in any reasonable amount of time. We can talk about this in the Q&A if you'd like. This is currently a showstopper. Second, what does it mean for you and I to live inside of an unfathomably large black hole? If this is technically a possibility, and if it's physically equivalent to what we experience now, then what experiment can I devise to distinguish this conclusion from the non-universe black hole hypothesis? I don't currently know of anyone's right now. And third, if black holes give birth to baby universes, what does it mean for me to exchange information with another universe? What if the properties and constants of nature are slightly or greatly different from ours? If I take a measuring device like a ruler from our universe and put it into a different universe where the conditions are very different, perhaps one where carbon atoms don't exist, my measuring device will be useless. Currently, these are fascinating speculations that we don't know how to test. I, of course, am excited for the future because I would never be so short-sighted as to underestimate humanity's capacity to come up with ingenious solutions to impossible problems. So I give you this question for those. Is this an artificial or an intrinsic limitation to our knowledge? Some might say they're intrinsic. I would claim that we just need some advancement in the future to show that they're artificial. Because the biggest challenge we face uh, is how to study a black hole up close. If we could do that, we would be way ahead of the game. And to figure out how to study black holes up close, we need to understand how to make black holes. So how do black holes come into existence? How does the universe make something so dense that it nearly punctures the fabric of space-time? Well, one way is when an enormous star dies. After billions of years, a star can exhaust the fuel that it needs to, uh, needs to, uh, to shine, and, and one final hurrah, explode. And this explosion, and, after, as all, as, and with no nuclear fusion to push it outward, gravity wins, and the whole thing collapses into a, and this collapse can in fact be, uh, can, this, can, this collapse can in fact be so catastrophic that it creates a black hole. So what about those apple-sized black holes, like the one that's perhaps masquerading as a planet 
in the outer solar system. This smaller black hole is something we refer to as a primordial black hole, and there could be a very large number of these in the universe. Primordial black holes are conjectured to have been produced in the very early universe, less than one second after the Big Bang, or a few minutes, depending upon who you talk to. As you can see, making a black hole requires a violent event, like an enormous star exploding and collapsing, or like a literal Big Bang. So is it possible that we could make miniature black holes where I work at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN? The Large Hadron Collider is a 27-kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland, where we smash together protons at extremely high speeds and energies, higher than anyone has ever used in an experiment before. At the very small scale, this is a pretty violent event, and it's theoretically possible to create a tiny, modified version of a black hole, a miniature black hole, that would evaporate immediately. Now that might sound dangerous, so perhaps a little more detail is in order. First, no, despite what you may have read on the internet, and I, may, I, I, I might be shocking some of you if you might learn that what you read on the internet, not all of it is real. Um, so despite what you may have read on the internet, we are never going to make a regular black hole at the Large Hadron Collider. It's literally impossible for us to do that. First of all, remember what I said with respect to a proton. If I wanted to make a black hole out of a proton, I'd need to compress it into a volume that I physic it's physically impossible to access. But remember what I said, black holes are made not just by the presence of mass or matter, but also the presence of energy density too. So when we take these protons at the Large Hadron Collider and accelerate them to very high speeds, that accelerates to a very high kinetic energy too. You remember from physics, kinetic energy is the energy of movement. So you might imagine that if you take a proton, something very small, and never make a black hole out of it by itself, accelerate it to some very high kinetic energy, maybe that's enough to smash the two together and make a black hole. It is not possible. <laughs> it's still impossible. There's, not, there's just po not possible for us to, make to give it enough energy to, it, to a single proton. As the two protons smash together, there's no possible way to make a black hole. Um, I think I'm going to skip this next little bit for the sake of time. How much time uh, do I have? Anybody? I'm going to keep going. Okay, great. So, yeah, so let me, let me, uh, I'll go into a little bit of detail here. So, because in just, it's actually kind of weird. So this notion of what a modified black hole might actually be. So what do I mean by that? So again, like I said, we're never going to make a regular black hole at the Large Hadron Collider. Because the other reason is, remember that, uh, that black holes are all about gravity, right? And there are only four known forces of nature, right? There's the strong force, which is the strongest force that we know of. It's the one that holds quarks and gluons stuck together into protons and neutrons, things like that. And it's the strongest one we know of, so I'll give it a strength of one, yeah? And that's, of course, the most important force that we consider when we smash together protons at the Large Hadron Collider. Okay? Then there's another force that you, quite, that you probably know quite well, which is gravity. <laughs> there's two other forces that I'm skipping in here, electromagnetism and the weak force. But compared to the strong force, gravity is 10 to the power 30, minus 39 compared to the strong force of 1. So when we collide protons together, the strong force is important. Gravity is not important. In fact, this slide right here indicates one of the biggest open questions of physics. Why is gravity so weak compared to the other forces? The other ones are up closer to 1. It's like maybe you know, uh, 0 0.1 or 0.01, something like that. Why is gravity so weak compared to the other forces? Well, the answer could be that perhaps gravity, you and I experience gravity as only a small temporary slice of a multidimensional gravity that exists in, hyper, in, in other dimensions of space. So remember how we talked about space as this strange thing that in, in fact can bend and flow. Also, it's entirely possible there are more than three dimensions of space. And if that's the case, then maybe these extra dimensions are where gravity preferentially exists. And if we were able to somehow have a special measuring device that could measure gravity in extra dimensions, we would measure it as being just as strong as or on the same footing 
as the other forces of nature. So this is a bizarre postulate, because where are these other dimensions? <laughs> I, I only have three that I can operate in. I can go up and down, back and forth, and side to side. That's it. Well, it's entirely possible these other dimensions of space could be tiny and curled up at every point in our universe. So you don't, you don't feel them, you don't experience them, but gravity does. And if that sounds strange, think of it this way. Imagine you have a friend who's a tightrope walker, and she's currently walking on a tightrope between two buildings. And you're on the ground. She's up very, very high, and you're watching her. From your perspective, she only has one dimension that she exists in. She can go forward and backward. She goes side to side, she falls. If she jumps up and down, she's probably going to joggle and fall as well. So she has one dimension that she exists in. Now imagine you take a drone with a camera and you zoom in close to the rope. I don't know why you'd want to do this, because you're probably distracting your friend and causing her some difficulty. But if you're doing this, imagine you're an ant on the rope. If you're an ant on the rope, you have an extra dimension. You can go back and forth the same direction as your friend, but you suddenly have another dimension that was hidden to go around the rope that was not, that was not visible to anybody else. So if that's the case, gravity could in fact preferentially exist in these tiny curled up dimensions of space everywhere all the time, and you and I don't experience it, and your particles don't experience it either, but gravity preferentially exists there. So this would be amazing, but also, how do we possibly test this idea? Well, one possible way is that we could do this at the Large Hadron Collider. So this is an idea of how we can make a black hole. Remember, a regular black hole we're never going to make. That's impossible to make a regular cosmic black hole with two proton collisions. But again, like I said, imagine that the entire universe has tiny little curled up loops of dimension everywhere, and this gravity preferentially exists there. Oh, and this is an image of some kind of animation trying to make, kind of trying to blow your mind with what it would mean to have multiple dimensions. I just kind of like it there. <clears throat> but imagine two protons collide, and instead, as two protons smack together at such high speeds in just the right way, they smack together at such a high energy that they briefly, uh, they briefly create this hyperdimensional graviton that would wobble into these extra spatial dimensions before then snapping back into our universe and decaying into things that we can see with our detectors. And this is, in fact, what we look for at the Large Hadron Collider. So as, such, as, as of right now, we have seen absolutely no evidence of these miniature black holes, which is unfortunate. But it's also kind of good for you, because oh, it's just in case you're worried about these as well. Because again, people talk about this. And in fact, I'm telling you, it's completely safe and harmless. It, to it completely is. But you also might be worried about this a bit, too. But keep in mind that when we say at the Large Hadron Collider, we smash together protons at the highest energies humans have ever used in an experiment before, the key phrase is by humans. The universe has higher energy collisions going on all the time around us. In fact, not too far above our heads. Our Earth is constantly being bombarded by particles from outer space, like high energy protons, for example. And these are coming in at energies thousands of times that of that, what we use at the Large Hadron Collider. So if, if the upper atmosphere and these, energy, these protons smack into atoms in the upper atmosphere, and they typically result in a kind of shower, a sort of rain of these particles known as muons. So every single one of you right now has about one cosmic muon going through your head every second. And it's never affected you at all. So if it's possible for us to make dangerous black holes at the Large Hadron Collider, then it's already possible for, then, then we would have had you know, billions of years worth of possible uh, dangerous black holes occurring at the upper atmosphere. This has never happened. N there's never been a mysterious black hole that suddenly sucked in the Earth coming from the upper atmosphere. So it's not going to happen at the Large Hadron Collider. But in fact, if you think about it, if these miniature black holes do exist, and it's still possible we'll discover them at future, uh, with, the, with future data taking at the Large Hadron Collider, if, if, it, if they actually do exist, then this is what's happening all the time. These particles are coming, and these are the muons coming down into your, into your head every second. Let's see. So if this is true, then this is also creating a tiny little black hole uh, at the, in the upper atmosphere, which in fact could decay to something that comes into our, into our uh, atmosphere. 
And so I'm going to skip this part, but uh, right. So these little miniature black holes could be being produced in our upper atmosphere all the time. And so they might decay just at the very beginning of the, of the, uh, the upper atmosphere. Or in fact, they might be passing through the Earth all the time. Or in fact, they might actually decay right near the edge of the Earth, which is something we could also detect in some of our experiments. So in fact, this whole idea of studying a black hole up close would shed monumental light on the subject. That's really what we want to do. And it would be phenomenal if we were to create miniature black holes at the Large Hadron Collider. Because the real reason that we physicists are obsessed with and fascinated with, uh, by black holes is that they could help us answer one of the most baffling and long-standing mysteries of science, which is related to that question as to why gravity is so weak. The mystery of how gravity and quantum mechanics work together. In physics, we have two fantastically good theoretical models that have withstood essentially all of our experimental tests. One is called general relativity, like we said, which describes gravity, how gravity works on very large scales. And the other is called quantum mechanics, and it governs the world of the small. Each of these by itself ranks among the most impressive intellectual achievements of humankind. But there's a problem. When we try to naively put these two separate theories together, hoping for a more fundamental theory of nature, everything breaks. We get nonsense answers like infinite energies or probabilities greater than one. <sighs> when this happens, this is the universe's way of telling us to think harder. We suspect that far back at the moment of the Big Bang, some kind of quantum gravity must have existed. And the current, in the current universe, the place where these two theories collide is inside of a black hole. So studying a black hole up close in a laboratory would shed monumental light on the subject. We, like I said, we haven't seen miniature black holes at the Large Hadron Collider yet. But maybe, to finally see them, we just need a bigger and more energetic collider. Discussions are currently underway for the potential successor to the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, the Future Circular Collider. Presumably, when the future becomes the present, they'll change the name. A 100-kilometer circular to reach do such a thing. Well, oh, in fact, one of my colleagues thinks that we don't really need to, be, to build something that oh, goes around the solar system. In fact, he thinks that we can reach the Planck energy only going around the sun about one-tenth of the distance between the Earth and the sun. So, Maybe we'll do that in the next couple of decades, something like that. But by the time we finally uh, have, uh, by the time our civilization has advanced to be able to do such a thing, we'll likely have developed interstellar space travel as well. <coughs> oh, perhaps there as well. We'll likely have developed interstellar space travel as well. And at that point, it might even be easier, easier to travel directly to a black hole in space. And at that point, 500 years from now, you will be sitting in your spaceship traveling to a black hole. One day in your ship, you get tired. You note that you should arrive at your destination in about 12,000 years, so you decide to take a 12,000 year long nap. And as you lie down on your cryogenic bed, you very slightly bump your ship's accelerator you don't even notice. After 12,000 years, you awake, fix yourself a cup of coffee, and you notice from your gravitational sensor that something is very wrong. You seem to be too close to the event horizon of your black hole. You stare out the window, and you see an enormous, profoundly black disk in space. The light from the stars and galaxies behind it twisted and deformed. You stare into the center of this disk, a cosmic eye staring back at you. And it's the emptiest thing you've ever seen. Your jaw drops and your eyes widen and, and you realize that you're not sure if you've passed the event horizon, the point of no return, yet. 
you double check your gravitational sensor and it says you're not there yet. You have five seconds to blast away. You leap from your chair, jumping toward the controls for the rockets, spilling hot coffee all over your hands. You scream and fall to the ground. And by the time you get up, it's too late. You're passing the event horizon of a black hole. You close your eyes. You nearly stop breathing. And your mouth feels like sand. You can't believe that you could possibly be in this situation. You open your eyes and you look out the window and you see everything is about the same. The disk is maybe getting a little larger, but otherwise everything is, is nothing is different. You, you feel the same. You, you think maybe, maybe you got it wrong and maybe there's still a chance to escape. You, you triple check your gravitational sensor and it says that no matter which direction you point it, you are pointing into the center of a black hole and then you know for sure you've crossed the event horizon. You are inside a black hole? A calm terror settles over you. How did you get in this situation? For a long time, while you were fast asleep, the conditions of the universe around you were changing very slowly, almost imperceptibly, until suddenly everything changed. Floating in your spaceship inside of a black hole what do you do? You might start thinking of possible escapes. I, I mean, maybe it's possible that all the clever scientists were wrong and that there's still a way to escape that hadn't been anticipated. You, you start fantasizing that maybe if you just get lucky or you just wait long enough, the situation will sort itself out and you will eventually pass back over the event horizon, back to the universe once you once knew, back to the way things were. And as you're fantasizing, you look down and you notice that your feet are drifting away from you and your legs are being stretched into long, thin, spaghetti-like strands. And then suddenly, your shoes are so far away that you can't see them anymore. And in that split second before you reach the center, you realize two things. One, that no one really knows what happens in the center of a black hole. And two, the only way out, if there is a way out, is directly through the black hole. Sometimes reality becomes twisted, seemingly beyond recognition. And right now, as the planet burns, and as the global temperature rises, and as terrible war rages across the world, and as so many of our fellow humans allow themselves to be duped by pseudoscience and misinformation, Right now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it seems as though we've fallen into a societal black hole. In retrospect, it seemed like it happened so slowly, nearly imperceptibly, while so many of us were fast asleep. And then, everything changed quickly. But, just like in a black hole in space, the only way out is through. There's no going back to the way things were. Our current societal black hole is a golden opportunity to construct a better world and to think in radical new ways to do so. Think about what we're facing right now. We have so many problems right now, and we have to ask ourselves, as science-minded people, are these unsolvable problems or are they in principle solvable if we just work hard enough and we just all work together? But to do so, we have to dig deep, really deep. When you travel to a black hole, you can study the very fabric and structure of space and time in detail 
to learn what creates these twisted sinkholes. And right now, we can collectively use this challenging moment to study the fabric of society itself. How do the social structures we've built around us lead to such societal black holes? And how can we upend them? For example, there's more than one reason we should consider building a particle collider around the moon. The first reason is scientific. Such a project would teach us incredible things about our universe. But the second reason is existential. Our society is addicted to repeating its mistakes, and we seem to be on the verge of simply giving space, Mars, and the moon to wealthy private individuals and corporations whose only interests are extraction, exploitation, and profit. This is bad, because this extractive and exploitative mindset here on Earth is leading toward the destruction of humanity due to anthropogenic global warming. Instead of encouraging a moon rush, where commercial interests compete to see who can extract moon minerals first and who can be the first to build a luxury lunar wellness spa for billionaires, the moon should be protected in perpetuity against commercial exploitation. And a project like the Circular Collider on the moon, and it doesn't have to be that, so many of my astronomer and astrophysics colleagues have pro proposed radio telescopes and gravitational wave, wave astronomy and things like that on the moon, Projects like these, mounted solely because our species is curious about the universe, would center the fact that the moon belongs to everyone. And if we don't center such projects when we explore space, we'll simply repeat the same catastrophic mistakes that we've made here on Earth, and we'll never change our collective mindset, and we'll, our species won't be around long enough to advance technologically to experience what it's like to sail through a cosmic ocean of stars, possibly to explore a black hole 500 or so years from now. Think about it. Right now, you always have to ask yourself, when I come to the limits of my knowledge, is this an in artificial limitation or is this an intrinsic limitation? And you can apply this not just in science and society, but in your life too. I am guessing that there's somebody or a few people in this room, like me, like all of us, that is going through some difficulties. We all go through difficulties in our lives. And at some point you start thinking to yourself, ah, there's something wrong with me. Ah, there's something terrible. Oh, I can't do well on this exam. Oh, I don't know how to get this thing. And da, 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 da. There's something wrong with me. When you're going through difficult times, keep going. Just like in a black hole in space, the only way out is through. You will learn something about yourself, and you'll learn that artificial limitations are just those, and you can push beyond, and you can achieve exactly what you want to achieve. And it's important for us to keep this in mind because, of course, it's important for us to keep this in mind because the things that connect us as humans are much, much stronger than the things that separate us and those people that try to separate us from each other. And we need to keep this in mind not just for those of us alive now, but also for those in the future, too. Because, of course, it won't be you traveling to a black hole 500 years from now. It's up to us to fix our social inequities, and it's up to us to ensure that our species isn't crushed into oblivion so that your great, 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 25 greats granddaughter can push forward into the unknown to better understand humanity's place in this vast cosmos. Thank you.